all our actions are interactions. This photograph was taken in Lebanon after the 2006 summer war, and it has toured the world as the world press photo of the year. To me, however, this photograph is very personal. You see, I am from Lebanon. I grew up in Beirut, and I have unfortunately seen this photograph long before it was ever a photograph. Lebanon and its capital, Beirut, have been in a war-torn zone for at least the last 40 years. In my lifetime alone, there has been two major wars, one of which lasted 15 years, without even mentioning the so-called smaller conflicts in between.、Um, you who are here today from Belfast can relate to that, I'm sure. Now, this photograph. To me, is a remarkable illustration of the segregation, disunity, and fragmentation that I witnessed between people while growing up. You see, this fragmentation and disunity may have been happening in Lebanon at the specific circumstances and at the specific time. They are, however, not limited to Lebanon. They're not even limited to conflict areas. Fragmentation, ladies and gentlemen, is a world problem. It's a universal problem. As a mathematician and philosopher from the 19th century stated, the misconception is the notion of independent existence. There is no such mode of existence. Every entity is to be understood in terms of the way it is interwoven with the rest of the universe. In today's world, we do not exist in isolation. We are all highly interconnected and deeply interdependent. And I am not just mentioning the communication. Technology that has become quite obvious to us. Think of our physical tra transportation and travels, our economies, our politics, our natural resources, our human resources, and our environmental issues. Today's news, issues, and problems reach everyone, affect everyone, and we need everyone's involvement to address them. The root of many of our global problems today is, in fact, fragmented thinking, fragmented behavior, and fragmented solutions. To tackle these problems. We actually need to move from fragmented thinking to comprehensive thinking. Now, as opposed to fragmented thinking, comprehensive thinking happens when we converge and collaborate towards a common goal in the global interest. Comprehensive thinking actually means co-creating together new alternatives to tackle today's local and global problems. This is what I call comprehensive innovation, and the essence of comprehensive innovation. Is human interaction. Comprehensive innovation can never happen without human interaction. Now, I'd like to here stress that we cannot design interaction itself. Instead, we need to design the context for interaction. And when I say context, I mean the space we are in, our environment, and that includes the pen you're using, the chair you're sitting on, this room, the building, the city, and the people. And it is everyone's responsibility, including designers and architects. To create the context for human interaction. In fact, I would like to just stress three things here today. First of all, we are responsible for designing our context. Second, we are responsible for designing our context. And third, we are responsible for designing our context. So, how can we create context for human interaction? This question, this vision, is what I call architecting interaction. Architecting is a term I use to convey the idea of a verb, an ongoing action, a process. Interaction is literally interaction; it's the action happening in between. Architecting interaction actually explores human interaction on a scale of intervention, a scale ranging from products to furniture to building, interiors to the urban intervention. I'm an architect. Traditionally, architects, are, architects design and build buildings. They start at the very beginning of the design process and end at the end of construction when the building is ready to be inhabited. The minute the people move into the space, the architects have gone. Just, I never understood that. I mean, for me, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense. For me, I, I just think that it is precisely at that moment when people move into the space that the building's life begins. It is exactly at that moment that as I, as an architect, want to be the most involved. You see, we need to actually move architecture, extend it into architecting. I believe it is our responsibility as architects to extend into the living phase of the building. It is our responsibility to accompany the people as they move in and settle into the space. 
From the perspective of human interaction, architecture is static. Architecting is living. And extending the role and involvement of architects from static architecture and into living architecting is actually crucial to refine that context for human interaction. I always say I don't want to make architecture. I actually want to use architecture. Because I believe that the value of a space, beyond its looks, is really in how useful it is for the people using it. And this is why my focus is much less on what something is and much more on what it does. The value of something, whether it's space, it's product, anything you name it, is not in what it is, its label, its name, its status, isn't really what it does. The action, the verb, how it relates and interconnects to the context around it. And this is why I am less interested in designing more independent competitive products and more interested in looking at the collaborative space between them, their context. Now, let me tell you a story. An architect was asked to design a university campus on a site that, seen from above, would have looked something like this. So she goes ahead, she designs the different departments and builds them on site. And contrary to the expectation of the staff and students, she doesn't design any routes or pathways. Instead, she plants the whole site with grass. After the first semester, paths have formed in the grass. The architect then comes back and pays them. Now, what she discovered was that not only were the paths in unusual locations that the architect herself couldn't have predicted, none of the paths were straight. There are three qualities I want to emphasize from the story, the three qualities of a human context. First, the context is incomplete. The architect did not seal and finish the design. Instead, she left it unfinished, incomplete, open. And that precisely was the invitation for the staff and students to give their input. Designing incomplete invites participation, collaboration, interaction. The second quality is that of an impermanent context. The architect did not cover the site with grass, with asphalt, she covered it with grass, which is intrinsically flexible. Designing impermanent allows flexibility. It allows entities to be recreated and to regenerate themselves. Designing impermanent creates interaction. The third quality is that of an imperfect context. Remember the path, they were in unusual locations and they were not straight. Designing imperfect actually invites us to celebrate textures, smells and stories. It invites us to relate to the character, personality and history of an entity. And that is interaction. So, to trigger human interaction, I strive to create buildings and spaces that are incomplete, impermanent and imperfect. You can now imagine the challenge that that gives us. It is, in fact, a challenge to our assumptions. What I am saying is we have now shifted our designer role. We have shifted our role of designer from a dictator to a facilitator. We now have new roles. We now have to have new roles. And the role of a facilitator is one that allows us to move from fragmented thinking to comprehensive innovation. And remember, we don't design innovation itself no more than we design interaction itself. We design the context for it. And that context needs to embody the three qualities of a human context. The incomplete, the impermanent, and the imperfect. Designing the context for comprehensive innovation, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence of architecting interaction. Architect interaction is about designing our future. And designing our future is today everyone's responsibility. Designing our future is everyone's responsibility. Designing our future is the largest and most important design brief anyone could ever get. And that is the design brief I choose to invest myself in. And I invite you, in fact, I urge you to join me. Because after all, all our actions are interactions. Thank you very much.